Welcome to Next in Tech, an S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast where the world of emerging tech lives. I'm your host, Eric Hanselman, Principal Research Analyst for the 451 Research Arm of S&P Global Market Intelligence. And today we have a special edition of the podcast that includes highlights from an important live stream event that addresses diversity and inclusion in technology. It's based on a 451 Research Voice of the Enterprise study on diversity and inclusion and features Melanie Posey, the Research Director for Cloud and Managed Services who authored the study, Sarah Cottle, S&P Global Market Intelligence's Global Head of News, and is moderated by Sarah James, Industry Editor on the TMT News Team. It's a conversation that explores progress and challenges around diversity and inclusion and looks at how S&P Global is working to address them. I hope that you find its insights valuable. Welcome to this session of Market Intelligence Live. I'm Sarah James, an industry editor on the Technology, Media, and Telecommunications News Team. Today I am joined by Melanie Posey and Sarah Cottle to discuss new data regarding the importance of diversity and inclusion initiatives in the wake of the pandemic. Melanie Posey is Research Director for the Cloud and Managed Services Transformation with 451 Research. Sarah Cottle is the S&P Global Market Intelligence Global Head of News. Thanks to you both for joining us. And thanks to our audience for tuning in. We invite you to submit questions via the field in your platform, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the session. Melanie recently authored the Voice of the Enterprise Digital Pulse Diversity and Inclusion 2021 report, which sheds light on how DNI is monitored, measured, and executed upon within companies. The research finds that digital leaders are ahead of the curve on DNI as it relates to tech, and they may well have a better shot at digital transformation success. Melanie, for listeners who might not be as familiar with 451 and Voice of the Enterprise, can you talk about what it is and how it works? Absolutely, Sarah. And first of all, I wanted to thank you for inviting me to this session. Glad to be here today. Uh, just a quick overview of Voice the Enterprise. It's a research product. We have 451 Research that surveys IT decision makers across a wide range of industries on a lot of different industry topics. And we traditionally focused on things like cloud, security, storage, IoT, but we've also decided to take a deeper dive into diversity and inclusion, specifically looking at how women are represented or not in IT departments. And that's really important because IT is basically what's fueling the digital economy. So it's really important that diversity and, and inclusion be a priority in making sure we have a diverse and inclusive digital future. Your report seems to stress the importance of formal uh, diversity and inclusion programs and or commitments. Why is it important to have formal goals versus informal or less concrete ones? Well, one reason is having a formal commitment or formal goal basically advertises to your organization and to the world at large that you're actually serious about it. And anytime you make a formalized commitment, one of the other things involved in that is that you can be held accountable for the re results and the outcomes of that strategy. And those outcomes can also be measured. So the way I put it is having a formal strategy is you know, kind of table stakes at this point. It's a way to demonstrate that you are committed to, at the very least, talking the talk around diversity and inclusion. And indeed, what we found in our study, and for some reason, the very nice big percentage at the top of the slide has refused to appear, but 60% of the organizations in our panel that we surveyed have a formal diversity and inclusion commitment or formal program. So talking the talk is basically the foundation for building a more diverse and more inclusive organization. Sarah Cottle, throughout your career, have you seen um, either this move toward formalized plans versus informal ones? And how have you seen that uh, play out? Absolutely, Sarah. And, you know, first, I just want to congratulate Melanie and the team 
on this great piece of research. I mean, one of the ways that S&P Global likes to participate in the debate is by revealing this great data and insights that will shed light on, on the situation that, that we're seeing in diversity and inclusion. And yes, through my career, I've seen progress from, from uh, being reliant on individuals. So for example, you know, if you happen to have the right manager back in the day, you would, you know, you get the opportunities and you would get the, the visibility that um, that women and other minorities are, um, or other disadvantaged groups um, needed. And the, the great thing now is that as we see these companies coming into adding formal plans, those are no longer something that you're just reliant on, you know, one individual being um, helpful or, or having that, that visionary um, view of the future of business. So now the formal recognition, as you say, the, the measurements, the metrics, I mean, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, right, is the way that we're, we're thinking about these things at S&P Global. So yes, a big move towards formal plans is something that we, we see as a real positive. Yeah, that's that's a really great point about not needing to rely on the luck of the draw in terms of having a, a great manager. The report also found that approximately half of respondent organizations reported an expanded commitment to DNI during 2020. But the pandemic year was also a time of great budget constraints. Do formal DNI programs impact the bottom line? Are they resource intensive from a budgetary perspective? Or do companies have to think about the opportunity cost? from not having these programs in place. Melanie, do you want to start? Yes, I would say the latter, that not having these programs in place will cost you more in the long run than what it costs you to put them, put them in place. And I say that again, going back to this point about um, digital transformation, that the extent to which an organization can pivot toward a digital way of doing things and combine that with the physical real world way of doing things is ultimately gonna determine the long-term success of the organization. And one other thing I wanted to point out was that of the organizations who, uh, there are 60% of organizations who have formalized DNI programs, that number increases to 71% among organizations that we've identified as digital transformation leaders. So I think there is a you know, pretty, pretty obvious link between having formal DNI policies in place, being a digital transformation leader, and then being a successful company in the digital future. I think one way organizations need to think about their commitment to DNI is that it's a way to develop your employee base as well. And to the extent that you want to have a successful company, why would you limit your scope to just a certain population when you're looking for talent, whether that's talent in marketing, talent in sales, talent in IT, and then talent at the leadership level as well. The world is digital, the world is open, the world is global, well, it's becoming more so in the, in the aftermath of the pandemic, and you have to cast a wide net for talent and leadership in a digital economy. Yeah, I mean, even as a hiring manager, I am definitely always looking to attract and especially retain. Retention is key. Um, the most uh, talented and diverse group of employees that I possibly can. And it's uh, anything I can do to make, to bring in the best talent and then keep them. I am, I am definitely willing to do it in this, in this environment. So let's drill down though on that connection between um, digital leader, digital transformation leadership and formal DNI strategies, because I think that was uh, something that your report definitely found. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that connection? Um, yeah, I can. Um, one of the key things related to all of this is when you look at the data 
segmented by organizations that are digital leaders, organizations that are kind of coming along the digital transformation spectrum, and organizations who are just not there yet and are totally behind. You see a pretty big difference in terms of both the commitment to DNI and also the commitment to women in leadership, and you also see some differences in the IT department itself. When you look at digital leaders, digital learners, and then folks who are lagging behind on the digital transformation curve. The way we look at it is it's pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, as you can see on the screen here, that you know, the digital leaders take this view that you know, we need all of the talent we possibly have, we should leverage all the talent we possibly have for leadership. So therefore it's not terribly surprising here, although it is kind of surprising that the numbers have gone all wonky on the slide, but uh, that digital leaders are significantly more likely than their other counterparts to look to expand leadership for women in their organizations. And it's a pretty linear relationship. The more digitally advanced you are as an organization, the more diverse and inclusive you are in terms of you know, who's at the table making decisions and also who's in the room where it happens in terms of putting together all of the different pieces you need to have a digitally transformed organization. And that's it for this special edition of Next in Tech. Thanks for staying with us for this important discussion topic. Join us for our next episode where Simon Robinson, head of research for 451, will be joining me to discuss 451's research agenda and dig into the realities of digital transformation. I hope you'll join us then because there's always something Next in Tech.